Hey folks, Still Cowboy here coming to you from Austin, Texas. And tonight we're doing part two of dating old tobacco tins because uh, they're expensive, they're delicious, and the more you know, the less you'll spend and the better off you'll be in terms of uh, making sure that you're getting what you're paying for. Um, in the first part, um, we talked about tin dating, hand dating, new blenders, new packaging, tin shapes, um, and, uh, and we covered a lot of ground in that, and uh, uh, I hope it helped you cut some corners. I've got a lot more to cover tonight. Uh, as always, before I get in, I'm going to start with uh, what I'm smoking. It is a Solani uh, 633 Virginia Perique. This one here is from 2001. It was actually in the last video. I needed to open it after looking at it. Uh, in a Paulo Becker uh, poker. Um, and as I said in the last video, uh, something psychological. I want a nice pipe when I'm smoking something that uh, has cost me a, a few bucks. Um, so I'm going to dig right in. And, uh, one final note too before I do. Uh, in the last video, uh, because I was rushing through, I mistakenly said that the new cotton blends and Warhorse um, were made by Standard Tobacco of America. It's not Standard Tobacco of Pennsylvania. I apologize to any of those folks that by some minute chance you're, you're watching this now, but I want to make sure credit gets to where it's due. Um, anyway, so I want to pick up where we left off, and tonight we're going to talk about um, uh, a little bit more about how to recognize tins. We're also going to talk about uh, knowing whether or not the tobacco is is in good shape once you've got that tin that you're looking for. Um, as I said in the first video, much of this is detective work. Um, it took me years with the help of a lot of other pipe smokers um, in reading and my goal is to help you cut a few corners um, and also because I am only scratching the surface and I'm just not that smart if you have the opportunity to add something to the comment box that would help me out in, in broadening my knowledge base, um, I would really appreciate it because I am not an expert. I am a pipe couch potato uh, and that's where my views come from. So with trusty lemonade in hand, let's get going. Um, one thing I didn't mention in the last uh, video, in terms of packaging, which can be very, very helpful, is tin weights. And, you know, we're so accustomed to uh, stuff, you know, tins being in, you know, two ounce or 50 gram tins that we don't realize that there was a time period where there were 25 gram tins. Um, in the last video, I pointed to uh, Capstan. Uh, this particular tin is uh, probably in the 30-year range, um, uh, actually older than that. Um, and if you look at the tin, it was 92 grams. It was made by Wills, who then passed on blending to Imperial. Um, and ultimately, today, we have MacBaron blending it. So, um, Different tin weights also can be an indicator. Uh, another blender that you want to watch for on that is Retrace, Hall of the Wind, uh, Marlin Flake, all of those great blends from Retrace and some not so great ones. Um, uh, some came in four ounce tins, some came in 100 gram tins and Retrace does sell a 50 gram tin as well, although from a price to value standpoint, I don't think very many of them are actually sold. But uh, again, knowing your tin weights is another great place to get a little piece of information that's going to help you in determining the age of your tobacco. So next I want to talk about is distributors because a lot of tobacco that comes into the United States, or conversely, I would imagine, into the EU, um, is distributed by a central person. That Solani I was just showing you a minute ago, 
It was brought is brought in by Manjur International. Steve Manjur is a, a wonderful man, and um, so there are distributors. But distributors do sometimes change, and when they do, it helps us draw a line in the sand as to an era of a particular blend. It may also mean a, a change in blender or even a change in country. Um, so Retrays is, is a uh, manufactured name. Um, it's been blended by a number of different folks, starting with the original Retray shop uh, out, of, out of Scotland. And um, then it was blended by McConnell and currently today it's blended by K&K out of Germany. And so going back to the distributors, getting a sense of when distribution was also is helpful. I should point out that um, I typically don't want to buy, for me personally, um, and you'll have to decide for yourself, I don't want to buy a tin that is not uh, at least five years old um, and we're going to get into pricing in a little bit um, there are some steals to be had out there and, um, and sometimes buying a tin that's a little newer is helpful um, particularly if you know that blend well so let's talk about rat, rat trays for a moment if you look at um, the bottom of this tin, and I hopefully this will pick it up, um, right here where my finger is, you'll see that this tin of Howl of the Wind was distributed by XYZ. XYZ took over for uh, James Russell, and this is a tin of professional mixture. And, and you know, I'm I just going to deviate off track here for a second. Professional mixture is a great example, for me personally, of the effect of aging a tin. Um, this is a blend that I, quite frankly, find pretty boring. Um, it's a light English blend. Um, however, uh, time treats this blend very, very well. And whenever I get an opportunity to, to buy one of these tins, and they're fairly inexpensive, um, you can find them sometimes $20, $25 that are eight, nine years old. Um, it changes into something wonderful. As long as the base tobaccos are good, um, you know, sometimes the, the, the net result is better than the initial result. Um, if it's bad tobacco, it's always bad tobacco. Um, but don't give up on a tobacco simply because you don't like it new. And professional mixture, for me personally, is, is a great example of that. So, XYZ. Um, do I sound like I'm rushing? I am because I don't want to go another 25 minutes like the last video. Um, it blended, uh, distributed up until 2010. In 2010, moving forward, it's been a Rango. Um, so, looking at those distributors can tell us what era of rat trays. Uh, we're buying from. And I will tell you, particularly on eBay, a lot of these newer tins, you know, this has also a newer label on it. Um, and K, K the blender, does stamp the side, letting you know that it is German made now. But I see a lot of these tins on eBay with no date stamp. And I will write to the seller and ask him who the distributor is. And typically, if they say XYZ, I'm in the game, you're probably going to be bidding against me. Um, but uh, know that that tin is at least six years old, with this being 2016. Um, if you were looking at very old retro blends, um, you'll see the picture top. And the picture top. Um, uh, is going to indicate a tin that is probably from the 70s, maybe early 80s. Um, that it's going to be costly, there's no doubt. Um, but odds are it's going to be wonderful too if the seal is intact and it's a blend that falls in your wheelhouse. Um, a lot of these blends, even if they're not in production anymore, can be researched on tobacco reviews. 
Uh, I write a lot of reviews there. They're very amateurish. Um, find a reviewer that you like. Uh, follow them if their taste matches up with yours. But you can get a lot of information on tobacco reviews. And obviously Google is a wonderful thing. Um, I want to talk about um, uh, checking for leaks. Because I think this is really important. You do your research. You know your tin sizes, distributors, dates, logos, blenders, all that other stuff. And you finally get to the point where you're ready to, to buy that tin and shell out your box, right? So, how do you check for a leak? Well, there's some simple ways to do it. But you also should be aware that there are some tins that are notorious for leaking. Um, particularly the Samuel Gaywith and Gaywith Hogarth tins, these rectangular tins. I don't know why they're still in use. Um, I've had them come fresh out of the box from an e-tailer and grab the tin and the lid comes right off. Um, I actually had a gentleman on eBay, very nice guy, who dipped them in wax. And that's how he maintained the lids. And, and uh, unfortunately, I had a small kitchen fire to try to get the wax off of one. Uh, another story for another time. But um, these tins do leak. Uh, the typical round tins, the vacuum sealed tins, like the, the Escudos, the Dunhills, uh, some of the Hearth and Homes, these, these are pretty reliable. They generally don't leak. Uh, very rarely, um, but you do want to check. And so how do you know? Well, there's there's a couple of surefire ways to know whether or not the tobacco is intact. One of those ways is to, and I think it's, the, is to look at the tin itself, right? And so one of the things, we're going to go back to our picture top tin here for a minute. Take a look at this. If you notice, the lever on this tin is just lifted right up. And the reason why is because all of the magical stuff that's going on in that tin is just continuing to happen. The tobacco, the process that, that, of aging is going on and pressure is building up. If there were a leak in that tin, there would be no pressure building up. So that's one way to tell. However, it's not the most surefire way particularly if you can't get your hands on the tin. And uh, since a lot of these tins are purchased on eBay, um, how, do you, how do you know? And one of the things that I do, particularly, and I don't know if you've seen this happen, and I mentioned in the last video, there's a lot of tins being sold on eBay that are um, coming from estates. They're either being sold by a family member from a deceased other family member, um, or you know you have people, <coughs> excuse me, out there tag selling, and their you know part time or full time livelihood is getting stuff onto eBay that they've picked up at tag sales or estate sales. Uh, they generally don't know anything about tobacco or pipe tobacco, um, so how? Do you get them to give you the information you need before you shell out the money? And it's a very simple test. Have that person lightly shake that tin and ask them whether or not there's a clumpy sound or a rattle. Um, they may not know anything about tobacco, but most people uh, can tell the difference between a rattle and a lumpy or clumpy sound. I generally don't tell them what I'm looking for, um, just as a small way to keep them honest. Um, and when they come back and say, well, gee, that sounds clumpy, I know that 99% of the time that tobacco is still going to be fresh and moist and, and delicious. So uh, that's a surefire way, as well as being able to look at the doming of a tin. Um, Going back to tins that leak for a second. Um, another tin that's notorious for leaking 
are the rat trade ones. And they tend to leak right here around the seal. And on the very old ones, like, like the picture tops, there is a seam. And sometimes that seam will give way. With the bottoms, and this is not a guarantee, uh, you may have gotten some aging uh, before it gave way, so it doesn't mean it's completely not aged, if that makes any sense. Um, but I tap the tip on, on a tabletop. If it sounds to me tinny, um, the best comparison I can give you is like dropping a Canadian quarter and an American quarter. There's definitely a, a, a lighter sounding, tinnier sound to a Canadian quarter. There may be a leak in that tin. If that's the case, do your shake test if you can. Um, if you can't, ask to make that done. Um, vacuum sealing. And another thing I want to talk about when it comes to whether or not your tobacco is any good. A lot of well-intended people who sell their tobaccos, and even some sellers of tobaccos, um, will offer to vacuum seal either bulk blends. Many times I see vacuum sealing done in these type pouches. This is a, a pouch of St. Bruno Ready Rubbed. Um, I think it's from around 2002. And this pouch was in fact in a vacuum sealed bag these bags leak. Again, let me be clear on this. A lot of these vacuum sealed bags leak through the membrane. Now, if you're sitting out there and you do this uh, on pouches and bulk tobacco, you may say, well, I haven't experienced that. Well, my question then would be, how old was it? Because what the vacuum sealing will do is it will delay um, the drying out process. So in the case of, of something like this St. Bruno Ready Room, um, you might get five years where you would have gotten three, just to pick some numbers, uh, because it was vacuum sealed. But when you get to be 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, you're going to see that that tobacco dries out. In the early days of buying stuff like that, I would tend to bend the pouch uh, when it was vacuum sealed to see if I could feel if it was pliable. I have found that the that isn't always reliable simply because of the materials in the pouch and the material around the of the vacuum seal itself. Um, so I immediately assume if I see eight plus years on a vacuum seal, um, give or take, you know, there's no exact science here. Um, in all likelihood that tobacco is dried out. doesn't mean I'm not going to buy it. And the same thing goes uh, for a tin. If I know a tin has got a leak, um, but it's in very good condition, I may still buy it. But what was a $70 tin of tobacco may now be a $15 or $20 tin of tobacco, depending on its value to you and, and its value in the marketplace. Um, Another surefire way to look for leaks is the rust spot at the bottom of the tin. Um, people do cellar their pipe tobacco in cellars, unless you live here in Texas where, where you know, our houses are built on slabs. Um, but um, surface rust most often is okay, but I would not purchase it over the internet unless it was from a reputable seller like a pipestud.com um, or uh, somebody on eBay that I knew well that I followed um, or I could get my hands on that tin. Surface rust, I'll buy it but only from a very trusted source like a pipestud.com. Um, in terms of uh, a hole or even if, even if it's a pinprick hole. Not only do I not want to buy it because of that, I don't even want to rehydrate it. Um, sometimes you'll be okay, but I find oftentimes that that rust gets into the tobacco, it ruins the taste, and 
um, dare I say, it, it ruins your health. So, you know, I, I would stay away from that um, if possible. Um, next one I want to talk about and this is going to wrap up this two-part series is know your pricing. Now you've been a detective, you've, you've looked at tin sizes, blenders, and all the other stuff I've mentioned numerous times in these two videos. But you have to know pricing. If you don't know pricing, it's very easy to get taken. Um, there are eBay sellers that see a hot tin and they're selling it for an outrageous sum of money because they know it's in high demand. Pipe smokers are like pack rats. Um, we have a pack mentality and we all want that next great thing. And if you've been around the hobby uh, long enough, you know it blends that were not that popular or popular but not obscenely popular like they are today. Um, once the word got out, Everybody was rushing towards them, and there's. I, I'll give you a great example. If you're on eBay, how many brand new tins of Balkan Sobrani have you seen for 50 bucks? Um, they're asking it because they can get it. Um, if you're going to shop on eBay, not only do you need to know your price, but you also need to know your limit. No matter how much you want that tin, unless it's an absolute must-have for a special occasion and you have the extra dough to burn, when you reach that limit, don't go over it. And one other point about eBay when it relates, as it relates to, to tin sales, a lot of you folks out there like to bid, you know, where there's five days left in the auction. eBay is not a true auction site, and so. Uh, if you look at the fine print, you're going to find that it's just it's a storefront. And you're benefiting the, the seller, but you're really not benefiting yourself. Because unless it's a tin that's not in high demand, uh, you can guarantee that five days uh, is a long time. And so uh, I would be setting a limit, knowing what the value is. Uh, so how do you find that? Well. There's not a lot of ways to do it other than research. So I find myself watching a lot of auctions, even if I don't um, auctions, and even if I don't um, intend on bidding. Um, another great place I find is pipestud.com, and I've mentioned that a couple of times. Uh, very reputable, probably the largest seller of aged tins uh, in, in, the, in the U.S. Um, and his tin prices, I find, tend to be re very representative of what's going on in the marketplace. Um, this is not an exact science, so you're going to always find sometimes better deals on his site or deals that, quite frankly, are a little higher. But I will tell you that from a reliability standpoint and pricing, I find that website to be the most reliable. Um, eBay is reliable to the extent that you're watching a lot of similar auctions. Um, but so much of value on eBay is dictated by when the auction was set up, what time of day it ends, how many days it ran for. Uh, I, I see sellers sometimes that boggles my mind, but they're on the East Coast and they've set the auction to end at 4 in the morning. I don't know why, um, but it, a lot of those last minute bidders may be asleep. So, watching one or two auctions won't tell you uh, what you're looking for price-wise, but certainly watch a number of them and also uh, pipestud.com to either purchase tins or to um, get a sense of what the market is doing, and these prices do fluctuate. Uh, Elizabethan from Dunhill is a great example. It was up in the $75, $90 range. Um, for some reason, it spiked. Now it's back down in the $60 range. Not sure why, um, but last thing. Um, unscrupulous sellers. I've run across very, very few. Um, I had a seller 
once tried to sell me one of these Solani tins, swore up and down that the tin was um, from 2002, 2003. Uh, I knew it wasn't uh, because of the size of the tin. Uh, another seller, actually it may have been even the same seller, sold me or or attempted to sell me a tin of three nuns. If you look on the back, and this is why labeling is so important, you can see all the glue where he had torn off the label, which would have given me an indication of how old that tin is. And so it's important to know that. One other thing, and I, I put the tin down, so unfortunately I don't have it here to show you. In the EU, you're going to see stickers that come along the bottom of the tin and it's going to say something like tobacco kills tobacco will kill your nephew's boy uh, girlfriend or boyfriend whatever the point is is that um, those stickers were not always there um, to my recollection they came out around 2005 2006 another good point of reference so tin dating hand dating labels Blenders, tin sizes, tin shapes, packaging, um, distributors, EU labels, knowing whether the tobacco is fresh or not. Be a good detective. If you know these things, you'll be into a world of tobaccos that are like fine wines. If you've smoked a 10-year-old high-quality Virginia tobacco, or even a great English tobacco that's aged well. It's very hard to go back to the everyday stuff. And there, we live in the, in the best time ever for new stuff. The, the, the selection's amazing. But it's hard to walk away from the old stuff once you've had it. Um, I have a substantial tobacco seller. About 70% of what I smoke is aged blends for a reason. If you're watching this and you smoke aged blends, you know why. Um, anyway, this is Steel Cowboy coming to you from the great state of Texas. Have a great night. Happy cellaring.